Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Mohamed Moti uh, from the Sorbonne University and St. Antoine Hospital. And this is the International Academy for Clinical Hematology uh, broadcasting this webinar for you across the globe and across the, uh, around the globe and across the hematology uh, field. Uh, this is a very uh, special webinar uh, dedicated to uh, MRD and uh, novel technologies in uh, measuring uh, disease in multiple myeloma. And of course, we've done a lot of activities uh, about uh, MRD in multiple myeloma in the past, uh, but uh, we thought to uh, have this uh, live webinar uh, today uh, to celebrate actually some good news because uh, in uh, on the 12th of April, 2024, we had the uh, FDA ODAC meeting which endorsed actually uh, 12 votes out of 12, the use of MRD as the new endpoint in multiple myeloma clinical trials. And this has been an amazing uh, journey, uh, which involved uh, many top experts, but also uh, international uh, groups. And that was like the United Nations uh, for MRD and to help advance the field of myeloma. But of course, uh, the future uh, comes soon enough, as uh, Albert Einstein used to say. And uh, while we have MRD endorsed by ODAC, we already hear a lot of good news about new technologies, uh, especially mass spec. So the ICH thought to organize uh, this uh, uh, roundtable discussion uh, focused uh, on these issues, and we are able uh, to organize uh, these activities, as you all know, thanks to the generous support uh, of uh, our pharma colleagues uh, through unrestricted educational grants. And in the field of myeloma, uh, I can cite uh, uh, Pfizer, uh, Sanofi, uh, Janssen, uh, for Comey, uh, the Comey Congress, uh, GSK, uh, Minerini, Stemline, uh, but also Sebia, uh, who is also involved in this feed, and many, many others. And in order uh, to have uh, this uh, uh, discussion, uh, I am joined today by three distinguished faculty, uh, namely uh, Dr. Ola Langdren uh, in Miami, uh, Dr. Faith Davis uh, in New York, and last but not least, Dr. Hans Jacobs uh, in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. Uh, thank you all for joining. Thank you for making the time. And uh, without any further ado, my first question is going to you, uh, Ola if you can summarize for us uh, briefly uh, this uh, MRD adventure at ODAC, because you were involved there and you have contributed a lot and you've been a big, great advocate for the use of uh, MRD in multiple myeloma. Thank you, first of all, uh, Mohammed, for inviting me and for inviting all, all of us to this seminar. It's really great working together with you and, and thank you so much for this program. Yeah, so the work on MRD uh, for me uh, started over 15 years ago when I was working as a federal employee at the National Institute of Health, National Cancer Institute in Bethesda, Maryland, outside Washington, D.C. I started seeing in our hands at the NIH that more and more patients had a response. And I was thinking for myself, if you eventually are going to see deeper and deeper clinical responses, Either we will stop testing because every patient is in some form of a clinical response, or we have to develop better technologies. So we started in our lab looking for bone marrow-based and also blood-based assays. And I know many people listening here today, including all of us here on the faculty, have been interested in these things for a long time. 
But that was what, where my uh, interest came from. And I sort of put in together a, in, a task force in the intramural program between the NCI, the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, and also the FDA, because we were all part of the federal family. So we started an initiative in 2009 uh, that I spearheaded, and we had meetings at the NCI, and we had also meetings in Silver Spring at the FDA. And for several years, we started uh, pushing this together, pushing it forward, trying to see if we could develop a case for MRD becoming an endpoint, a surrogate endpoint for drug approval. And as much as it sounds like an easy idea, obviously there are a lot of practical and other barriers. So after having worked on it for quite some time, we organized in 2012 a workshop at the FDA in Silver Spring, where we shared all our ideas, everything we have done, everything we work on, all the data we have gathered. And we invited uh, academic groups in the United States. We had from uh, Sloan Kettering, Roswell Park. We also have some of the European groups. And we also invited some of the patient groups. We invited Brian Dury from the IMF and others. And we shared with them everything we have done and we invited them to work together we continue working and eventually I moved to New York in 2014. I launched a, an annual meeting on MRD and we also filed an IND. The meeting I mentioned in 2012 uh, triggered other people to think maybe we want to do it on our own. So there were sort of multiple initiatives, just how science evolves. That's how everything is. Like either you join or you do your own project. For all these years, there have been parallel uh, efforts. So our project started the way I explained it, and we called it the evidence meta-analysis. We developed a statistical analysis plan. We filed for an IND. We worked with the FDA. Eventually, out of this meeting, uh, the I2 team was formed, and they started working on their project. And we worked in parallel with different approaches. We approached the data set differently. We only included 10 to minus five or better. The other team included any data sets and we worked on different approaches. And fast forward in 2023, we delivered to the FDA all our results after having got all the data sets from all the drug companies for, for the evidence meta-analysis. And the same was true for the I2 team. They delivered all the data. And right after ASH of uh, 2023, the FDA had a meeting with us one-on-one -on -one for each of the two groups. And they told us the same thing, that we're going to be invited to ODEC uh, for April uh, in the spring of this year. They didn't give us exact date, but somewhere around that time. So for those who listen who don't know how ODEC works, ODEC is the Oncology Drug Advisory Committee that includes people just like us that give advice to the FDA. So there are outstanding members. They, they are members for a couple of years and rotate off. And I've been invited to be on ODEC in the past. So it's people like us that are on. So ODEC reviews and gives advice to the FDA after they, they vote. So that was a formal meeting. It lasted for many hours. It started at nine in the morning and it ended at 3 p.m. And the last step of the process is that the chairman of ODEC said, let's be quiet. We give all the members uh, 30 or 60 seconds to vote, and then they vote, and then they disclose the number, and then the meeting is over. So it's almost like a courtroom style where the judge asks, and that's sort of the whole journey. So I think the bottom line is that we were able to show that MRD captured one year after randomization is a very strong predictor of progression for survival, both in newly diagnosed and in relapse disease. And there is a window around that one year window. Uh, you can go all the way back to six months. You can even go up to maybe 15 or 18 months. And the FDA played with the data even more. And they showed that whenever you captured it, there is still a correlation. So the bottom line to end my answer here now is that the ODEC voted 12-0 in favor of using MRD as an early endpoint for accelerated approval you still need as a drug company to capture PFS and you need to design your studies so you have sufficient power. They have not yet implemented this in their current guidance documents, but uh, once that has happened, that will become the official way. For now, it is a, uh, is a decision that, uh, or is a vote by the ODEC, so individual companies that go to the FDA can refer to that and have a case-by-case -case discussion for drug development. But it really reduces the time window if you enroll patient for two years and you wait for 10 years for data to mature for PFS in a newly diagnosed setting, 
Instead, you can enroll for two years and after one year have MOD red. So you shrink 12 years down to three and you can have accelerated approval. And that's a huge change, obviously, for the field. It's going to be much faster access for patients. Many more drugs are going to go for earlier line. And I think it's great for the field overall. Oh, thank you, Ola, for sharing this historical perspective. And I'd like to thank you and all the stakeholders you mentioned for their efforts, but also for your visionary, uh, because you were visionary, I would say, uh, 10 or 12 years ago, thinking about this. And uh, just to echo what you said about acceleration, uh, I was just looking again and again into the uh, IMROS trial data uh, that uh, I had the privilege to be part uh, of it. And uh, the paper in the New England Journal of Medicine has a median uh, follow-up of almost five years. So we needed five years uh, to get the data released and uh, published. Uh, but of course, if we had relied on MRD, we could have, because obviously MRD was significantly higher at one year, and that would have been uh, a fantastic uh, advance. So let's dig a little bit deeper into the practicalities now. And my question to you, Faith, is uh, how do you use uh, MRD? Because we, we have a lot of questions already from the audience. How do you use in your practice today MRD? I guess we have the prognostication part. We have the dynamic risk assessment. But you may wish to comment on guiding therapy and uh, whether there is any threshold uh, today you rely upon? <laughs> they're, they're all completely great questions. And um, I'm not entirely sure that we we have all of that data to support um, to support from kind of randomized clinical trials. And there's certainly a lot of those trials going on. As you mentioned, there's a lot of really great data that's come out, um, particularly at ASCO and EHA this year, showing um, the kind of response to therapy and how you can achieve um, deep MRD negativity. I think for me personally, there's a few places where I definitely use it. Um, and so one would be um, when assessing patients who I feel maybe haven't had such a great response to treatment and I'm still concerned. So those potentially would be those maybe high risk patients, because we know that for high risk patients, we um, we if the, if patients don't achieve MRD negativity, then those patients will um, have a very poor outcome. And so if I have a high risk patient, I definitely want to get to MRD negativity. And so that might be that I need to up my game a little bit and add or change my, my treatment a little bit to make sure that that patient gets into the MRD negative state. For, for um, stopping therapy, I think that one for me is a little bit more difficult. Okay. We now have the whole concept of um, serial MRD measurements. And I think it's becoming very obvious that we shouldn't really, for treatment um, decisions about stopping treatment, we shouldn't be considering one um, assay to be um, sufficient. We need to have a period of time where patients have got what they now call sustained MRD negativity. Now, the question is, is how long does that MRD need to be sustained for? Is six months enough? Is a year enough? Um, and those are what all of those clinical trials are um, going through. And the reason I say I'm always a little bit nervous about stopping is for the very simple reason, as you know, for many years now, our maintenance therapies have been given on a continuous basis and we've had some incredible results. And so the question is, is if you curtail that, do you lose? any of the efficacy. And so I'll often on a day-to-day -day clinical basis, I will use my MRD negativity maybe to reassure myself and a patient if they're struggling with their, with their therapy and having side effects. Then I think then's a good opportunity to say, hey, all right, you're getting side effects. 
you're supposed to, you know, you're in a MRD negative um, complete response. It seems to have been sustained. Um, let's think about stopping that therapy because we want you to have a good quality of life. So I think that's one particular area I, I use it. And then I think um, as both Ola and yourself um, kind of alluded to, sometimes now our patients are having incredibly long progression-free survivals. Um, and so like, you know, when you start seeing a patient at four years, five years, and they're still in MRD negativity, and you're thinking, okay, you know, maybe this patient is in that cured box, you know, do I still really want to carry on with this treatment at that stage? And so that's another area where I, um, I definitely um, use, use it to help me. Thank you, Faith. Hans, can I ask you some technical questions about MRD? And uh, uh, do you see uh, some major differences between flow cytometry, uh, NGS? Uh, what is your preferred threshold in terms of sensitivity? Uh I look at it from a technical, more of a technical point of view. I think um, some guidelines want in most trials want you to have a, a sensitivity of detecting uh, one in uh, in one hundred thousand uh, 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 cells. So and and both NGS and, and, and next generation or the multicolor flow cytometry methods can do that. Um, um, uh, depending on techniques and what you read, maybe the next generation sequencing is a bit more sensitive, more easily getting to the 10 minus six uh, 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 level. Uh, in the end, what I think that most clinicians use is access to the methodology. So uh, they will think, where can I get these analysis? Can I have to, sh have, do I have to ship my, my cells? Where do I have to ship my cells? Can I do it in my institute? And, uh, and, and, uh, and, and sometimes also trials dictate to accessibility of these uh, of these methodology in the Netherlands, uh, uh, where our patients uh, enter most trials uh, of the Hove on the Dutch uh, uh, myeloma society. Uh, they I, I more often see the the flow cytometry uh, MRD uh, testing. Okay, thank you, Hans. Ola, uh, as since you are a pioneer. Uh, in the field of MRD, uh, what is the optimal use of MRD today in your practice? I think that's a very, very good question. And uh, before I answer in my clinic, I will uh, say that question was something that I didn't really understand uh, until I worked with the FDA for a long time to not bring up with the FDA. Because Everything we do in the clinics can be used for different purposes. Think about imaging. You can do it for diagnostic workup. You can do it for response assessment. You can do it for detection of recurrence. And that's true for many things we do, if not all, MOD included. So I remember talking to the FDA about these things, using it in clinic. And then they started worrying about that we're going to change the management. And that's not what they are doing. They're improving drugs. So I'm just echoing out, if someone is talking to any other agencies around the world, don't bring that up because it's just going to make it worse. So when you talk about MOD for drug approval, you're looking to see as a surrogate marker for clinical benefits. So you can check at the time point to predict PFS. That's what the FDA talks about. What we are talking about as doctors is how to use it in the clinic. And that's a completely different story. So... In my clinic, I have worked on MRD for 15 years because I was curious and I learned the hard way that it's a very strong prognostic marker. Uh, I think it's the strongest prognostic marker we have in myeloma. I think it's much stronger than fission cytogenetics, stronger than any of the other clinical markers. Uh, a lot of studies show in multivariate analysis that it's is the most powerful marker we have. So I check for my patients when they start going into VGPR or CR, I will check if I do a biopsy, I will send it for uh, MRD testing. Uh, I would do it, do it routinely if I treat patients that are newly diagnosed. Many times we give four cycles, collect stem cells, do another four cycles, and whether we transplant or not, it usually happens after that. 
So we would check after eight cycles and many patients in our clinic for years, because we have seen so many MRD negative, we have been open to harvest and hold the stem cells, which is not the standard care in Europe. I know I'm born in Europe. I practice in Europe. I know it's very different, but we have done that when I was at the NIH. We did it at Sloan Kettering. We do it in Miami. And we have patients we follow for over 10 years and they never recurred and they were never transplanted. And even if they did recur, they went to another therapy they were never transplanted. They do very well. It's the different style than the standard of care protocols in Europe and elsewhere. But we have done that. So after eight cycles, we would check. And if patients were transplanted, we would check. We would also, in the relapse setting, if we were to give CAR T cells, we would check when we do a biopsy after a month. And if patients go on by specific therapies, which we have used a lot, uh, we would monitor patients and we have seen CRs happening after one, two, three or four or so cycles. I'm sure we have all similar experiences. And we have many times done biopsies and PET CTs and those biopsies we also send for MRD negative. Lastly, for patients that I've treated in particular in the newly diagnosed setting, uh, I've done and we published on it, we have done repeated MRD tests on maintenance. And of course, you have to build data to, to learn how to, to kind of maneuver forward. So in the beginning, we did trials, but we did it once a year for five years. But in the clinical setting, I have implemented as a default for me, after the completion of combination therapy, with or without transplants, I'm much more open-minded to transplant than I used to be in the past. So I'm not mandating transplant. I do collect stem cells for the vast majority of my patients. But I do after eight cycles. And if they are MRD negative, I would recommend the patient to do it after one and also after two years of maintenance. If the patient doesn't want, I'm not going to push for it. But I've seen patients that are MRD negative after one or two years having a very good long-term trajectory in my hands. We use sequencing. We use in the United States Clonoseq. That's FDA cleared. And we also developed a Sloan Kettering and we set up in Miami a 12 color flow cytometry assay that we think can capture somewhere between one and two cells in a million, maybe two cells in a million, which is good enough uh, for practical purposes, but we do sequencing on every patient. We also developing the clonotypic peptides in the blood, and we are looking for other assays as well. And I would love to have blood-based testing. That would be wonderful for every patient. That's what I want to do. Thank you, Ola. And I think you're making my life very easy as a moderator because you brought the issue of the biopsy. And obviously, maybe face you can give us, let's say, uh, from a patient perspective, I don't believe biopsies, repeating biopsies is an ideal. I've never met a patient telling me, oh, that was a wonderful experience and we're going to have it again soon. I and mean, obviously, we can explain to them and they consent to it, but it's not the easiest uh, way. And this is why, uh, probably as Ola alluded to, we need easier, uh, softer, uh, more rapid techniques. Uh, and can, can you give us a summary about what do you think are the uh, current available techniques and how yeah. advanced they are? No, and... I so um, I'm, I'm going to say, I'm sure from my, my perspective, it's not just the patients that hate the bone marrows. I hate performing them as well. Um, so I, I think it comes back to something similar about um, what Ola was saying in the fact that when we're thinking about doing these tests, we have to kind of separate in our brain a little bit about exactly what we're trying to achieve, because um, as you know, when we do the bone marrow, we also um, not only do the MRD analysis, we also invariably are able to take a sample for um, um, regular sequencing or cytogenetics, and we can look at the architecture. So if we kind of keep that in mind when we're moving towards the blood-based um, technologies, there are a um, selection of different blood-based technologies. Um, I'll talk about kind of two of them, and I'll maybe leave um, hands to chat about the third one. But um, kind of on a kind of general basis, we can think about looking for circulating plasma cells within, um, within the blood. Um, so circulating tumor cells. And there's been some really nice work done by um, Irene Gobriel's team um, at the Dana-Farber and then um, Bruno Pavia's team um, in Spain, looking at the role of being able to detect 
these cells um, using flow cytometry or indeed using a slightly different kind of chamber method to, um, to find the cells. And certainly there seems to be a correlation between that test and um, bone marrow tests. There um, is um, also then obviously prognostic um, significance as well. One of the sort of potential problems with that is that you do actually need an awful lot of blood to be able to do that. And that's a kind of ongoing theme with, with many, but not all of the blood-based technologies. So for instance, I think um, when um, the Spanish team do their assessment, they actually use 50 mils of blood which potentially is fine. I can say there's not a problem with that, but it's not just a small blood test, I was going to say, is where we're coming from. You still need to take a significant amount. But the results look very promising. And clearly what needs to happen before those kind of tests can come into routine um, practice is for them to go through all of the different kind of approval um, mechanisms. The alternative way to actually looking for plasma cells within the peripheral blood would be to look for DNA, okay? So um, CT DNA. And so for that, we are essentially relying on the patient having a number of abnormalities, which we will presumably detect in the initial um, bone marrow sample. So let's, for instance, say that the patient has a RAS mutation that happens in about 50% of patients um, and some other form of mutation. You can then, moving forward, again, track those mutations from the peripheral blood um, in a serial fashion. But I think, again, just as um, the issue with um, kind of um, the circulating tumor cells, it's a sensitivity thing. So it is very, um, you can definitely detect them. But the question is, at the moment, can you get down to that 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6 approach that you can do with next gen flow or with um, next generation sequencing? So all very promising. Um, some tweaking. And I think that's the important thing to actually say is that technology is changing so incredibly rapidly, um, at much to the point as um, I'm sure everybody um, knows that now, you know, whereas before we were saying it, it costs, you know, X thousand to sequence the genome, there's now this whole discussion that you can maybe sequence the genome on a clinical level for um, cheaper than doing a fish-based test. And so I think those um, improvements in technology are going to make a massive difference to which tests we're going to be able to, um, to offer in the clinic. No, thank you, Faith, for bringing these futuristic, I would say, technologies. And you mentioned uh, when you started that there is a third technology, uh, namely high-resolution mass spec. And here I'd like to turn it to uh, Hans uh, because Hans, you've been involved in this field for many years and you've contributed a lot. So uh, just uh, for the sake of clarity, can you give our audience an overview about what is mass spectrometry? Because I'm not convinced 100% of the colleagues are well aware of uh, this emerging and very exciting technology. Great, I, I can do that. Uh, can I share my screen? I have some slides. Uh, uh... Uh, here on this uh, on this topic uh... well usually we don't do it but if you like to do it please do it let's give That's him great. the right to chair i'll i'll turn it to the technical <laughs> team oh fantastic super uh, i i i put the slides on exactly at the spot where faith stopped her story about looking at the cell so on the left obviously we have you can look at myeloma disease studying the cells mainly in the bone marrow but as faith uh, mentioned also, with these sensitive techniques, you can you can look at, at circulating plasma cells or their products, cell-free DNA or DNA from these circulating uh, cells. But on the right side of that of that spectrum are uh, uh, the monoclonal antibodies that these plasma cells uh, uh, secrete, and uh, and traditionally uh, they are looked at with uh, with. Uh, 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 electrophoretic uh, uh, techniques, but these are not sensitive enough 
especially now with these uh, with these uh, all these new uh, therapeutic agents and 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 mass spec can really help uh, uh, in that respect and and when in general not not in the, only in the field of myeloma but mass spectrometry in general can be looked at from uh, intact uh, mass spectrometry or or bottom up uh, uh, mass spectrometry and in fact thanks to the to the uh, investment of the mayo clinic and and develop the uh, top down uh, mass spectrometry uh, already in a clinical setting s- starting in, in in 2018 they developed this this intact uh, protein mass spec and, w- and what they do is they 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 purified uh, their uh, uh, their immunoglobulin uh, fractions including kappa and lambda and they make a, a a reduction step in which they separate the heavy chain from the light chain that gives them two advantages. Small uh, uh, proteins are easy, more easily and more sensitively uh, uh, picked up by mass spectrometry, but also the heavy chain is always glycosylated. And if you, the technique makes use of a very distinct uh, uh, mass overcharge value for each uh, 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 protein, and if it can be, uh, if it is glycosylated, this mass overcharge, it, it differs. So if you have a light chain that is not glycosylated, that has a very specific mass overcharge value. This is what they pick up uh, uh, using Malditov. So they measure uh, the mass overcharge of all the light chains in their purified fractions, giving them a spectrum uh, with quite nice resolution. And then they see that one of these mass overcharge values is overrepresented meaning that's a clonal uh, uh, light chain. And because they have all the fraction, they can say this is an IgA kappa uh, uh, M protein. Lately, first they, they started this as a qualitative uh, technique, but nowadays they can also quantitate uh, uh, that. And, uh, and uh, they used it and introduced it to replace IFE. They found it a higher uh, uh, workload and they replaced their IFE with this uh, uh, MOSFIX uh, uh, technology. And uh, Mayo Clinic has a lot of samples, so also a lot of experience on the on the method that they uh, that they use, and and they see that that it is feasible in all these uh, uh, patients. Uh, it is at least as sensitive as immunofixations, but actually what they show from their data, it's a little bit more uh, sensitive than uh, than immunofixations. You can pick up some more detail because sometimes these light chains are glycosylated that may have clinical importance. They show overrepresentation of light chain glycosylation in AL, AL amyloidosis uh, uh, patients. And they reach a nice uh, throughput uh, with that. They automated this technique, wrote software for easy operating in, the, in, in their clinic. And this is uh, commercialized uh, as Accent uh, mass spec. So now the data not only come from the, uh, from the Mayo Clinic, but also from other centers that, that, that are validating or are adopting this, uh, this method. And it's, it's, it's nice to see that with this gain in uh, in sensitivity uh, uh, it, it, it it also adds to the to the to the uh, to the prognostic uh, value it seems of this uh, this method in contrast to to this intact protein mass spec we work on clonotypic uh, 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 bottom up uh, uh, mass spec because we really wanted to compete with with the sensitivity that was found in bone marrow aspirates and uh, uh, from this graphical overview, you see that, yes, uh, the throughput goes down because it's a little bit more technically demanding technique, but you can gain sensitivity. And what we actually do with our uh, method, we first identify clonotypic peptides from the M protein. So every M protein has a unique VDG uh, uh, rearrangement and unique clonotypic peptides. Those are identified and we're targeted uh, LCMS, MS, uh, uh, these are uh, uh, measured. So the, the serum is, is we, 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 we use full serum. Uh, we digest it into these uh, small peptides. They are feed in the, in the, in the LC and then uh, uh, picked up uh, 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 by the mass spec with uh, 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 parallel reaction monitoring. I also have a small slide on that. Actually, it looks like, uh, let's see if I can... 
so that is this is idea we pick not so so, so you want to get rid of the clonal, polyclonal background eh? especially when they are treated the polyclonal background by far outnumbers the clonal aspects and and if we don't measure if we use only with target mass spec only look at this unique barcode from this uh, uh, specific patient you can gain a lot of sensitivity especially if you do targeted uh, mass spec uh, uh, with uh, uh, with, with, with PRM uh, uh, methodology. What it does, we select this, this unique uh, uh, peptide, then we fragment uh, 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 the peptide, and all these fragments are, are detected with a, uh, at a, sp a specific uh, retention time. We add a calibrator, so it's not only an on-off signal, but we can quantitate the signal in, in milligrams uh, per liter of M protein, because the barcode directly comes from this clonotypic uh, from the from the M prone protein, and also to visualize how this result looks like. So this is a sample from a patient with a stringent complete uh, uh, remission, uh, 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 and then okay, it's a nice signal. Actually, you see all the fragments at a certain retention time. It's a captured peptide, and all the fragments thereof. This makes it very unique, and you don't. Uh, accidentally pick up another pick a signal or peptide because it would have uh, 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 other fragments. But especially nice is that the, the background is almost absent. Of course, if I zoom in on this excess, uh, there, will be, uh, there will be background. Uh, uh, but in this sample where we, in electrophoretic methods, do not see any uh, monoclonal protein, you have a very nice signal with, without uh, a background. And then if you have a minimal invasive method, you can do it dynamically. So that is, that, is, that is nice that you now have a method that you really can use multiple times. And this is what we would see indeed in, 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 a, in, a, in a normal patient coming into our clinics. It is recognized easily with a good M protein, 10, 20, 40 grams per liter uh, going into treatment, but often very soon we have to report back to the hematologist. We, we, we find no signal. The disease is not gone, but we detect no signal. Uh, and that can go on for years. And then the first abnormalities come, uh, become apparent, maybe with a free light chain ratio abnormality, maybe with an IFE that becomes uh, uh, positive. Uh, but really what happens uh, underneath, uh, underneath uh, the... the, the the, the water level from with the iceberg is is, is this dynamic uh, MRD uh, uh, thing. The, the, the black dots are now MS, uh, MRD uh, analysis using clonotypic peptides. And, and, the, and the yellow shaded area is, is maintenance therapy. And in this patient, we see that soon after stopping a maintenance therapy, actually the, uh, uh, the, 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 the M protein really comes back and, and uh, so this is this is really new information for the for the hematologists, of course, to uh, that they that they can actually uh, yeah, look at it this way. But it's 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 more work, yeah. Can I ask you, Hans, about the sensitivity? What current what is currently the sensitivity? Uh, uh, we can easily measure one milligram per liter, and then we would have to compare it. With, uh, with, 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 with bone marrow aspirates. And we see that we have uh, at least the same sensitivity as is reached with next generation sequencing in bone marrow aspirates. That's, it's, really, it's really amazing. Are you talking about and 10 minus five? So even 10 minus six. So we, we, did, we, we made the method comparisons with, with, uh, with NGS using 10 minus six. So that, is, that has same sensitivity, yeah. This is beautiful. Thank you for this explanation. Uh, Ola, can I ask you, uh, from your perspective, what do you see as pro and cons of bringing mass spec into uh, more routine practice? Because, I mean, it is fascinating what Hans presented in this case of this patient. Uh, I do think that the mass spec uh, brings a lot of um, excitement to the field. Uh, first of all, as we have said here multiple times, uh, not having to do a bone marrow biopsy, doing a blood-based test is amazing for patients. Uh, I think it uh, allows us to think about a more frequent monitoring. I think that doing blood tests for MRD in my practice will not be once a day, once a week, once a month. It will be probably once every three months because I think there's also a psychological component. If you see that the numbers are not 
exactly zero and they go up and down. I think it also triggers a lot of unnecessary worry for my patients. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to probably think of it every three months or so. I think the mass spec uh, lends itself uh, to do very small volumes. I think uh, Faith very uh, beautifully covered some of the limitations with some of the DNA assays and the flow assays. Having 50 milliliter of blood is just not feasible. So having a tube, a standard tube, is say eight cc or eight milliliters, you cannot really draw five or six of those every time. Patients would not like that. Mass spec, you can run with 10 or 20 or less microliters. So we are talking minimal, minimal volume. So mass spec is beautiful with that. Uh, I think it's also quite high throughput. Uh, once you, you know the clonotypic peptide for the patient, you can run the sample quite quickly. So the turnaround time is good. So low volume, you can use serum and we quick turnaround time. That's sort of everything that we like. Uh, I think it's also a quite inexpensive, relatively speaking, test. But of course, uh, there will be more things that need to be hammered out, how it's going to be set up and all those things. I think every every test has its plus and minuses. Inherent limitations with all the protein assays is the fact that we are de treating a disease that lives in the bone marrow for the most part, that makes proteins for the most part. But uh, the proteins... Is they are not the disease cells. So if you treat the disease cells, you get rid of them, and they are not there. The protein they make can last in the body for a much longer time than the actual cells can. And a good example of that is the CAR T cells. So if you treat CAR T cells with CAR T cells in a patient that has say eighty percent myeloma in the bone marrow with an M spike of say three point five grams per deciliter, if you check after one month, many of those patients could be MRD negative in the bone marrow. But usually that M spike is about the same. It may go from 3.5 to 3.2. So if you don't really think about it so much, you may say, oh, the patient is not MRD negative. But that's actually wrong because it's the bone marrow that is the site for the disease. The protein is just delayed clearance. So I think as we get more and more sensitive assays, we could envision that that could be a dilemma of tracking protein. But I think every, every I, I'm sort of thinking always as an engineer, to me, every problem has a solution. So I think that the way to think about this and solve this for us is to build in machine learning into the algorithms for assessment. So if you have two time points for measuring in a given patient, if we see that there, there is a decay in the marker that mimics the clearance, I think we could envision a scenario where we do these tests early on and say, the machine picks up this and that amount of chronotypic peptides, but given the two time points, it's consistent with delayed clearance. And therefore, it is a negative finding for presence of disease. So it's sort of a little bit more of a complicated way of doing it, but I think that's what the field needs to do. I think for the detection of early recurrence, it's a completely different story because now you, you could envision a scenario where you have zero, 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 and if you see there's a rising marker, a rising marker is an indication that there's more protein being made by something that is disease. So you could think of it that way instead. But I think for the immediate implementation uh, to replace biopsies, uh, we need to think about how we're going to use it. And it's possible that there could also be a threshold effect that if you go under a certain level, that it's sort of okay. Uh, to call it uh, MRD negative, although there is a number. Like, think about how we do in the bone marrow. Mm -hmm. When we wrote the guidelines in 2016, we set uh, the threshold to 10 to minus 5 because the rest of the world could do that. We already knew at that time that 10 to minus 6 was better than 10 to minus 5, but then many countries could not do it. So that's why we did 10 to minus 5. And I think that could also be potentially something that could happen in the in the blood, that if we say it's below a certain level, it still could be negative. So I'm just sort of outlining some of the, the residual problems that we need to work on to fix. But I'm very, very excited. And I think clonotypic, clonotypic peptides is beautiful. It's very powerful, much more powerful than MOLGI testing. I, I, I think it's great. Thank you, uh, Ola. And you highlighted the complexity. So I want to add another level of complexity to you, Faith, because it's about the tumor cell. It's about the protein, but also 
myeloma specifically is a disease of the bone. So here bring, brings me to the issue of imaging. So I, I guess the best outcome for a given patient is to be MRD negative 10 minus six and maybe 10 minus seven tomorrow because the more uh, sensitive we are, the better it is. To be mass spec negative sustained over time and maybe to be PET scan negative. I mean, putting all this together, that's probably the best outcome. So how do you position imaging in this story? Or is, for instance, MRD or mass spec 10 minus 6 would become a surrogate for actually negative imaging? So that's a great question. So um, I think it's, it's very difficult. And I think, as you say, it depends on the sensitivity of your, um, of your MRD assessment. Um, so um, certainly when we were, um, when I was in Little Rock, we had the advantage of doing everything on everybody. Um, and so there are a number of great data sets from there that you can do these kind of comparisons. And as you imply, it's very rare for a patient who is MRD negative to 10 to the minus six to actually still be positive by um, PET scan. Um, very rare, but not impossible. Okay. And um, I think that's where some of the, the issues begin, because obviously, um, certainly when you're doing um, a bone marrow, you're obviously putting the needle in one place, and you don't know what's happening in another place. So they could maybe have a, a plasma cytoma in the clavicle, for instance, and you may not pick that up um, on a bone marrow. But often, you know, it, it, you can pick up that low level cell, um, potentially in the bone marrow to tell you those. And that's where one of the potential advantages of, um, of these um, uh, of the, um, mass spec techniques would be, because the assumption would be that a clavicle lesion would get picked up with the um, mass spec technique. On a practical basis at the moment, I do both. So I do both my MRD testing on my bone marrow and my PET scan to make sure that I feel 100% um, confident. I think for me personally, I think we need a few more layers of um, lower um, MRD testing before I'd be comfortable to give up on my, on my PET scan. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So we're reaching the last minutes of this uh, discussion. And I would like to ask each of you about uh, a concluding remark, especially uh, what do you believe is going to be uh, the future in this field of uh, disease measurement? And because it's clear uh, that this is crucial and it is likely uh, a mandatory step towards, I will not use the word cure, but let's say uh, long-term remission and allowing patients to live long and well, and maybe guiding and stopping therapy based on this disease negativity. I will not use only MRD because now we've heard about mass spec and many other uh, markers. Hans? I, I think, yes, yes, for, for, in, for prognosis and, and once or twice the, the bone marrow aspirate will, will and the extra information that we'll give, uh, looking at other cells or maybe other cytogenetics, it, it, we, we, we will not easily replace that. But when it indeed comes to sustained MRD negativity, when it comes to maybe MRD guided therapy, in which by fact means that you would have to assess that situation continuously, then I think uh, MRD, uh, then uh, 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 clonotypic peptide mass spectrometry can really help uh, 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 reaching that. So, and, and, and obviously in the near future, that will be in clinical trials, how, how, it, how, it, uh, how effective this is uh, uh, compared to bone marrow aspirates and also how effective it is in guiding MRD therapy that will, the, the future will tell, but that, that could be really uh, yeah, great added value for, for patients and their treatment. Thank you, Hans. Ola? So your question, Mohammed, is what's what's the future holding us? So I take that question as a little bit of a futuristic perspective. So instead of just talking about data, so I think, I think the disease has come to a point 
where we will have more and more patients having the same lifespan as a person with the same age and gender without the disease. So the way I think about it is the average age of onset for myeloma, at least here in the United States, is around 69. So say it's around 70. And if you think about the human projected typical lifespan, say it's 80 something, 83 or 84 or whatever on average, and I'm sure that's going to go up in the future for many of us, but let's say it's 83 or 84. So if you give a combination therapy with the best drugs we have today, thinking about ASCO and EHA, we see how you can provide very effective therapy independent of what you call transplant eligible or ineligible. You can probably get five to 10 years out of PFS for many patients. So if you start at age 70, if you think about it in an optimistic way, say you get 10 years out, that may not be true for every patient, but let's say many patients could. If you're going for 84 or 83, you're almost there. Or maybe you day, say eight years, say eight years, you go from 70 to 78. So if 83 is the number you need to, to pass, you only quote need five more years. And we have so many therapies for relapse refractory. So I think being a doctor, thinking about a new patient coming to clinic today or tomorrow who is 70 years old, I think about it every week in my clinic. I think that many of those patients will have the same lifespan as a person without the disease. I recognize the burden of having to deal with it, all the time commitment, all the toxicities and all that, and the disease can come back. And also knowing that not every patient is, is going to have that trajectory. But I think that's a huge thing. And I think in that context, MOD is going to help to not overtreat patients. If you have disease that responds well to good therapy, I think blood-based MOD testing will allow us to step back on the therapy without giving the patient, uh, with, uh, without providing the patient with any kind of guardrails. So right now when we take off therapy, what we worry about is that that could be some slowly recurring disease. So I think having those blood-based MOD tests would just give us those tools to make those decisions in a more formal way. And if we see that there is some slow recurring, I think we can go back on therapy. That's how I envision the field will go. And I think it's going to also impact a lot of the other concepts that we for a long time were trained to do induction therapy, consolidation therapy, and da 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 da. I think that's going to also go away because if you have the ability to test, I think you can forego steps. I think you can do combination therapy and reach MRD negativity and maybe go to maintenance like the way I was saying that we have done for a long time. I think that's going to be more common and you may choose CAR T cells for some patients and bispecifics for others and transplants for others. I think I think the blood-based tests are going to change the whole field for the better. So that's my future outlook. Thank you very much. Very optimistic vision and I share it completely. Face, you have the last word. I have the last word. So I was I was just thinking um what Ola was saying earlier. Um and um I actually did my PhD um, with Andy Rostron um, in Leeds 28 years ago. And my PhD with him was looking at MRD. And at that time, we were doing flow cytometry, 10 to the minus 4, um, as part of the MRC clinical trials. And um, little did we know that, you know, it's taken 28 years to get to this stage. But now that is a um, is a kind of um, uh, an approved test in the, or oh, well, let's rephrase that. It's now being used in the in the clinic. And um, I think what kind of over the time frame, when you think about that, that was 28 years work. But then just look at changes in the last 10 years, for instance. Um, they've just increased dramatically. Um, and as I say, I can see that in the next few years, we'll be thinking about taking our peripheral blood and doing whole genome sequencing on that so that we've got the whole genome of the um, of the patient and then obviously serially following them in the peripheral blood for um, for their response. So I think that, yeah, we may have been a bit slow, um, but I'm praying that before I retire that we've got both of these things in place and I think it's going to make a massive difference for myeloma patients. Thank you, uh, Face, for this uh, lovely conclusion. There is a clear acceleration of the face of the pace of uh, innovation uh, in medicine in general, but specifically in multiple myeloma. 
And uh, we usually celebrate the approval of new drugs, but I must confess that today uh, we were celebrating the advent of new technologies, new methods, and all of this is extremely important because we are lucky that in hematology, it's a field involving both the clinic and the biology. It's a sort of a continuum uh, between the biology and uh, uh, the uh, clinical application. Uh, I have learned a lot from you guys today. I'm very grateful. I hope uh, uh, the audience has enjoyed uh, this uh, webinar. We had a lot of questions, but I didn't disturb because actually you were answering progressively most of the questions. We couldn't answer some specific, very detailed, sometimes personal cases, but I'm sure if needed, you can uh, connect with the faculty and ask your specific question. Uh, but for the time being, thank you, uh, all of you. Thanks uh, to our faculty. And uh, this is the ICH. So wherever you are, please stay safe and keep well. See you soon.